Hey, welcome back to Fat Mama Physics. In this video, we're going to talk more about uncertainties and what happens if you make repeated measurements, how to deal with uncertainties then. Okay, so why would you ever want to make repeated measurements? Why? What would that, how would that be helpful? So let's say you made one single measurement and it was completely, or something went wrong in that particular experiment. If you have repeated measurements, the impact of that single measurement becomes less and less. So you look at your data as a whole, as opposed to that just that single one. So it, because of that, it is able to reduce your random error, making your measurements more precise. So it's a good way to, uh, to help um, build precision in your data set, okay? So always good to conduct repeated experiments, okay? And another way to make your measurements more consistent with one another, for example, a big factor in terms of variability in your data is if you say have someone timing uh, something, for example, then you got someone else to time it, okay? But what about the, these two people? They have different reaction times. And because they have different reaction times, that's going to give you Ver variability in the reaction time data that you, uh, sorry, variability in your data because of different uh, reaction times. So a good idea was to, is to maybe get one person to take all of the uh, ex the data timing itself, which is something that when you do write your labs essentially uh, later on, is good to mention these things in your experimental design. It shows that you are thinking about reducing uncertainty, reducing um, reducing error in your measurements to begin with. Okay, so those are some um, thoughts there. Now, with a repeated set of data, what would you do? How can you do it? The um, the quick and dirty way to get the uncertainty from a repeated set of measurement, for example, I have an example down here. How long does it take a one kilogram mass to fall a height of 10 meters? So I drop this pen 10 meters above the ground, I drop this four times, and I get four time data, okay? So I have, a, I have four, different set, four different data. How do I get the uncertainty? So the quick and dirty way is to take the range of the data and divide that by two. Or in other words, you take your max max data value and then you subtract it by the min data value and then you divide all of that by two to get your uncertainties, okay? And of course, now you have your uncertainty. Uh, how, do you re how do you report your data as a result of that? So you would report from your repeated trials an average. How do you take the average? You sum everything up divided by the number of data that you have, okay? So then after you have your average and your uncertainty, you would have something that looks like this. So let's say uh, this is time, right? So I'm going to write time. That's my time data plus minus my uncertainty. And the symbol for uncertainty, we use this little delta sign. Okay, use that delta sign T. And you'll see that in your data booklet in say the first unit, you would see a delta sign. That just means uncertainty, okay? So a uh, few rules when we talk about uncertainties, usually you round your uncertainties to one significant figure of exception when you have a very small uh, uncertainty, which is less than say 2%, but otherwise, generally we use one uncertainty. And whenever, we talked about this in the last video, but whenever you report your uncertainties and your average value, making sure your average value is rounded correctly. And so that the place value of your uncertainty matches the last place value of your average. I'll do an example to show you what that means. So we have here, the uh, the experiment that we did for a one kilogram mass to fall a height of 10 meters. So we don't really care about these numbers right now. Right now, we just want to report out our average time. So let's do that first. So our average time, we're gonna add the four numbers and then divide by four. I get 1.425 
And at this point, I'm not going to do any rounding right now. I don't even round to however many significant figures I had originally because that rounding is going to be determined by my uncertainty. So no rounding right now. I'm going to do calculate my uncertainty, which is is the largest data value here, which is 1.45 minus my smallest, which is 1.40. And I'm going to divide that by 2, which is going to be 0 0.05, divide that by 2, and that's going to be equal to 0 0.025, okay? And because it's an uncertainty, I have to round this uncertainty to one significant figure. So rounding this one up, I get 0 0.03, because that's a 5. That's my uncertainty. And because my uncertainty is in the hundredths place value, I need to make sure my average is rounded the same way, which is exactly number six figs we had to begin with. But that's not always the case. So we always have to check after we get the uncertainties first. So rounding this one up, we get 1.43 seconds. So then I'm going to write my final answer here, 1.43 seconds plus minus 0 0.03 seconds and I'm going to box it like that. So whenever you're doing a lab and then you are writing out your final number for that particular uh, repeated set of experiments, this is the correct format. This is what I like to see. I check the units and I check whether or not these place values are in agreement. Okay. Okay. So that's pretty much what that looks like for the... Um, uh, for doing the average and the uncertainty. Right now, maybe it's a good idea for you to give the next one a try. So the next one, uh, just quick brief talk here. Calculate the average time it takes for a pendulum to oscillate once. So the experiment is, uh, it, this is the time it takes a 80 centimeter length pendulum to oscillate 10 times. This is the time data in seconds. So what that means is, uh, if you're not sure, imagine if you can see me, I got a pendulum. I can use my pen, for example. So then I, uh, this is, I see this oscillating and I'm going to time it for 10 oscillations. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so that time I record is 17.95 seconds, and I do that for four trials and record my data. You might be wondering why I'm taking 10 oscillations instead of one, if that's exactly what I'm looking for. Give you a moment to think about it right now. And if you're thinking, well, if I take a longer span of time, then if I make a mistake, or let's say I have reaction time factored into my uh, measurement, then that particular amount of time takes a smaller percentage of my whole measurement, okay? And so otherwise, if I took, say, one oscillation, that's going to be what? About two seconds. So if my reaction time was, say, 0.1 of a second, 0.1 of a second takes up a larger fraction of two seconds versus 17.95 seconds, okay? So that's kind of the idea why we like to take bigger measurements as opposed to smaller ones. But be careful whenever, when uh, you're taking, calculating for that total, or when you're reporting this one over here, you got to make sure you divide that by 10 because we only want one oscillation, okay? So uh, given kind of like a brief heads up there, I think you can now do the rest, all right? Good time to pause the video, do this question by yourself. Okay, I'm going to go over it. All right, so again, we're going to find the average time, and hopefully that's very self-explanatory. Sum it up up divided by the number of data we have. I guess 17.9825. Okay, so don't forget, no rounding yet. We got to do the uncertainties first. And that's our max minus our min. And our max number here is 18.09. My smallest number here is 17.90. So I subtract these two numbers, take half of it, which gives me 0 0.09, oops, and then divided by 2, I get 0 
five seconds, okay? I'm gonna round that to one significant figure. So this five is gonna round that nine up to a 10, and so I'm gonna have to bleed over to the next place value, meaning that's gonna be 0 0.1 seconds for my uncertainty, and as a result, I need to round my uh, my value here also up to the tenths place. So that's the eight rounding the nine up. Oh, hey, look, I'm rounding that nine up again to a 10. So then that 17 then becomes 18. Uh-oh. And uh, as a result, that's going to be a zero over here. Okay. Now, you please don't just forget about that zero. Why? Because remember, the number I report needs to match the place value of my uncertainties. They have to be on a, in agreement. My final answer is going to look like 18.0 seconds plus minus 0 0.1 seconds for my uncertainty. Okay, so here we go. Oh, Ha ha ha, exactly what I told you before and I forgot myself. This is for 10 oscillations. I need to calculate it for one oscillation. So that's easy. I just have to divide both of these by 10, including my uncertainty as well, because I am now looking at one oscillation. So here I take this, I divide it by 10. I am going to get, moving the decimal place over, 1.8 and... That's going to make that, uh, yep, so I have to report, re keep that zero, and then plus or minus, moving that decimal place over again, sorry, not that one, that's going to give me 0 0.01 seconds for my uncertainty, and this one is my final answer for just the one oscillation, okay? So whenever we do an experiment or whenever you design, if you design an experiment that has that involves a pendulum or multiple uh, multiple oscillations or whatnot within the same data, making sure you account for that division at the end. Okay, so hopefully there's uh, these examples will help you. I wrote it down here. Uh, uh, conceptually, you can never be more certain than your your uncertainty. And I think I'm missing something here. You can never be more certain than your lowest lowest uncertainty okay so what that means is that uh, you always you should never report more place values than you have your uncertainty because those place values are meaningless since you all re are already that uncertain with your value okay though so that's just what this means and explains why you have to round your average value properly okay so hopefully these examples give you a general idea of how you may tackle your data when you have an experiment or when you have to design your experiment yourself all right so thank you for watching i wish you good luck fat mama physics signing out